In this leg of my journey through every one of the United States of America, I'll be driving the huge distances that will take me from one end of the country to the other, from Montana and the border with Canada, all the way down through the Rocky Mountains and the Great Plains to Texas and the very different border with Mexico. I want to discover America's heartland, its spectacular mountain spine and the great food basket beside it, and how Fortress America is increasingly conscious of the need to protect its riches. And I'm starting at the Airborne Border Patrol headquarters in Great Falls, Montana. The goal is to be out of here in eight minutes if we have to be. That's a scramble time. That's amazing. That's, time. That's the goal. In Montana, one of the things I noticed when I moved up here was a lot of folks don't even lock their door. I think the United States had that attitude before 9-11 pretty much, but I don't think we can afford to leave the door unlocked. 49th parallel. In the World War II film of the same name, it was described as the longest undefended border in the world. Far from undefended today, this imaginary line nearly 4,000 miles long divides the United States from Canada. Here in northern Montana, the officers of the Customs and Border Protection Agency had their work cut out to patrol it. On the ground, there is now more urgency. With a dramatically increased federal budget over the last few years, the work of agent John Miller and his colleagues is now taken very seriously. So, here we are, John. This is the other side of the fence is the Kingdom of Canadiana. That's correct. Wow. Where Her Majesty is head of state. I believe America is the greatest country there is. And uh, there are a lot of opportunities here that, that people want to take advantage of. Bottom line is, we have to protect our homeland. Yeah. We have to protect it. I see no crowds of Canadians desperate to get in and taste the um, air of freedom. They're strange things, frontiers, borders. They seem so... Imagine it. Yeah. My hand is in Canada and the rest of my arms in America. Some sort of obelisk. An actual international boundary mark. An international boundary mark. So, in fact, there, have we, you're not telling me we've been in Canada all this time? Yes, we have. We have? Oh, how very extraordinary. I didn't even show my passport. So, that, oh, that says United States, and that says Canada. So, in fact, I can... I'm now genuinely straddling the 49th parallel. My right foot is breathing the air of freedom. My left foot is in the strange, incomprehensible, but clean world of Canada. You're in Canada. Yes, sir. Guess I better move. Yeah. <laughs> Much of Montana, as its name might suggest, is made of mountains. And this region of the United States is rich with magnificent wilderness. The system of U.S. national parks was expanded into what it is today by President Teddy Roosevelt from 1901. And in a nation with a mixed reputation in matters green, they are a shining conservation showcase. Glacier National Park in northern Montana covers an area of one and a half thousand square miles of the Rocky Mountains. It's home to mountain lions, rare Canadian lynx, wolverines and black and grizzly bears. Wow. That is so beautiful. Stunning. As a geologist working here, Dan Faber has an enviable job. Pretty hard to take this for granted. I come down here at lunch and look at it periodically just to make sure I don't ever take it for granted. Good air. Yeah, this uh, water is so clear. Isn't it staggering? Yeah, you, you can look down on the fish. Because it's a very deep lake, 478 feet deep, 
uh, it'll remain very, very cold for a very long time, and, and that's one of the reasons that um, it's so clear. Nothing yeah. basically can grow in it. I'm, so I'm, bound to, I'm bound to ask you um, uh, the, the obvious question when you get to a glacier national park. One of the best-known apparent effects of global warming is the, the melting of glaciers. Mm -hmm. and here we are Absolutely. in a glacier national park. Have you detected that? Is that a, uh, are you a, a believer in, in global warming? Uh -huh. uh, I measure it, so yes, I am. Essentially, our glaciers have gotten smaller and smaller, and the rate at which they're getting smaller is accelerating, and we don't anticipate that we'll have any left by 2020 to 2030. If in 10 years' time they discovered um, um, incredibly valuable minerals or indeed fossil fuels here, is it, it's, nothing's going to stand in the way of that, is it? No matter well, if, if it was the last source for that, that might be the case. Mm. But Americans have a huge love affair with their national parks. And I think that national parks like this will be protected until there's absolutely no other options. Well, the more I travel in America, the more extraordinary I find the landscape. Nature has got just a little bit potty in this part of the world. It's a rather American characteristic to overdo it, and nature is very American here. I drive now into southern Montana, preparing to meet a semi-retired master of the universe. Ted Turner's energies these days are concentrated on saving the planet. After founding the pioneering news channel CNN and marrying Jane Fonda, he is, with over two million acres, the largest private landowner in America. Oh, and the media mogul owns 46,000 bison, which I'm hoping to be introduced to. It's the largest land animal in uh, North America, followed closely by the polar bear. He squeezed me into a brief window for a healthy breakfast, and I've been warned that he has the powerful man's impatience with prattle. Yeah. Look at this. When the light hits the hills, it gets pretty Those gorgeous. are mountains. Mountains. Hills. Sorry, <laughs> that's terribly wrong of me, isn't it? That's what we call them here. Definitely mountains. <laughs> how, long, how long will the snow stay? For another, another couple of weeks? Depends on how warm it is. <laughs> That was a very, very dumb question. <laughs> we have a 40-mile uh, border with the National Forest there. And at night, you, you, you can't see another human thing. There's not a single light from there, from horizon to horizon. Would you rather have... Uh, Bronx-style eggs? Or, no, 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 no. No, seriously, I'm fine with granola. It's, my doctor would approve. That's right. Ted's ranches are more than mere rural Xanadus, however. He owns nearly 20% of the total number of buffalo in the U.S. How many ranches of, of bison do you have? Approximately 10, give or take. Their numbers had dwindled to the verge of extinction, and by his example, he's hoping to encourage U.S. ranchers to switch over from environmentally unfriendly cattle to these indigenous bison. The, the reason that bison have a hump on their back yeah. is so they can snow plow down when their snow is deep so that they can get grass to eat. Yeah. Cattle don't have the hump on their back, so they'll starve to death. Dairy cattle also produce huge amounts of gas and are profligate users of grasslands, both factors in climate change. Why do you think there's so many deniers of global warming still around? There were a lot of people that thought the world was flat. The terrorists believe they're going to get 40 virgins for blowing themselves up. No, you know, I mean, it, that, that's almost worth blowing yourself up, right? <laughs> Although I never understood what the appeal of virgins was. Uh, <laughs> well, they, they might get a 70-year-old nun. <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> There's a couple. Oh, oh there we are. Look, on the... Oh, all right, all right. Yes. Hip, 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 hooray. Sure their tails because if their tails start going up then that means they're getting upset either that or they're taking a dump they also raise their tails when they go to the bathroom so <laughs> you don't know whether they're going to charge or take a leak do they stampede i mean do they, they do they do 
My hopes that we'd be able to view these fearsome beasts from the safety of the car were soon dashed. They may move away from us. Then they may charge us. Find out when we get a little closer. Is there a particular response one should have if charged by a buffalo? Run like hell. Well, I'll remember that one. Are they slower uphill or downhill? They're fast both oh, ways. Oh, damn. Hi there. We come in peace. It's a wonderful sight. There's something about that shape. It's so imprinted in one's imagination from illustrations as a child, and because they are as connected to this landscape as, as the mountains. Yep. They? They're really yep. They are. They are. It's bye-bye bison, and time I allowed the state line with Idaho to give me a lesson in geography. Well, as you can see, the state line between Montana and Idaho is also the continental divide. Well, you were probably much better at geography at school than I ever was. I had to have it explained to me. A continental divide is something to do with water, with streams and tributaries. Essentially, if I was to pour this water here, as I am doing, this side of the continental divide, the water would eventually trickle down, following gravity, into streams and tributaries, into a river which would ultimately, and must ultimately, drain into the Atlantic Ocean. On the other hand, if I were to go this side, that water is going to drain all the way to the Pacific. That's roughly, in a nutshell, what a continental divide is all about. Idaho, romantically known as the Spud State, is sparsely populated with a mere one and a half million people. It's known, too, as the Gem State, being almost as rich in precious stones as in humble potatoes. Idaho, home to nine national parks, is also stunningly beautiful, but I have to move on. We are hitting yet another state line. This time, we're saying goodbye, Idaho, and hello, Wyo, Wyo, Wyoming. The state of Wyoming is, if anything, even more dramatic. It, too, is generously endowed with wonderful national parks. And a decade or so ago, wolves were reintroduced into the wild here. It became a federal offence to shoot them without cause. You can't help admiring their beauty. And at this animal sanctuary, I can get a safe, close-up look. But how do the ranchers who live and work in the wilderness now cope? I've come to visit a couple whose ranch is as remote as any human habitation I've ever visited. It's in the middle of Wyoming, just over the mountains from Yellowstone National Park. Holy shit! Come on, taxi. You can make it. The cattle ranch that the Robinets manage is about the size of an English county. Ha <laughs> you, ha! You must be Debbie. Yes, I am. Stephen, how do you do? Nice John? to meet you. Yes, sir, nice, nice to meet you. Very nice. What a place. This is how you wake up every morning. Yep, yep. <laughs> My goodness me. Sometimes it'll take two days to get to the highway. <laughs> when you come back from town, you realise you've forgotten that pint of milk you were going to buy. It must be... Oh, bother. It's as beautiful and wild and perfect a vision of the true West as one can imagine, but part of me thinks I would soon start to go a little bit cabin sick. You know, I'd get weird. It's a lot of hard hours, and if you don't enjoy that type of work, you'll never last. You only see people when you want to. 
We like yeah. living at the end of the road. <laughs> <laughs> But as far as wildlife is concerned, it's rather a popular spot. And this is a grizzly bear that got into our uh, horse barn. Look at those claws. Yeah. That's what, that's what uh, can pull your face off with a single swat, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes. Enormous bear. John and Debbie actually coexist pretty well with the grizzlies. It's the reintroduction of the wolves in nearby Yellowstone that's causing them sleepless nights. I can hear them howling. That's our dog. That's, that's our your dog. dog. Yeah. I was going to say they're, they're just. That usually that's an indicator that there's wolves, wolves around, around when they howl like that. Yeah. Right. This morning after we fed our horses, uh, we let the dogs out to go with us, and one of the dogs didn't come home. And you think they may have taken your dog? They've taken six in the past. Really? And most of them have been killed right here in the yard, close to the house. I lost an 11-day-old colt. It was another pretty sad deal to go through. I can sense it's personal with you. Yes, so yes, very. They feel strongly enough to have compiled a photographic dossier of the wolves' aggression, and it's not for the squeamish. This is one of the calves that the wolves chased and bit, but yeah. they didn't stop and eat it. But they made a mess of it. Let's yes, be this is what they look like when we usually find them. There's absolutely nothing. Oh my goodness! Nothing left. Here's one of our dogs. She was killed right out the back door. She was very dear to us. A recent recording they made here really brings the point home. That's the real thing, isn't it? We hear that quite often. <laughs> it sent the fear of God into me, I have to say. <laughs> While the Robinets are busy keeping the wolves from the door, a hundred miles away in another part of Wyoming, their cousins, the Huskies, have bonded with their trainer, Stacy. Good boy, buddy. So what you want to do yep. is swing him around, and then if you're holding on with your legs together, yep. your arms are free. And you can squeeze if he tries to get away. Okay. And then the harness is going to go over his head this way. And pumpkin. pumpkin. Yeah. How about that? And then his little paws just head through. And then you want to get a leg in there. And then you want to get a leg in there. Whoops. That's a good Excellent. boy. Hey. Ah. This mode of transport is fabulous fun and seems to give as much pleasure to the dogs as to the lucky passenger. Sliding along in this fairy tale setting, it's easy to see why northern Europeans felt so instantly at home in this part of America. The neighboring state of North Dakota has a rich and rather overlooked European heritage too. It is unforgiving terrain, and it was hardy German immigrants who first attempted to tame it. Their descendants now make up a high proportion of the citizens of its little capital, the appropriately named Bismarck. Time for a hearty lunch. At a diner whose house speciality is Knöpfler dumpling soup, and whose registered slogan is the suitably Germanic and direct Sit down and eat. Deep fried hamburger. Yes. It's outrageous. Oh, I see. oh my goodness. It's in a pocket of. <laughs> and of course, the two great staples of American food are the hamburger and the frankfurter, the hot dog and the, and the burger, both of which are Germanic in origin. And of course, Mr. Heinz was German, let's not forget that. And actually, there are more German Americans than there are Irish Americans. It's certainly left its mark on food and on my tummy. Clarence Glatt, himself of German descent, explains why his ancestors went for such calorific food. Thrashing and plowing and, and you know, building houses and what they did, they could eat all they want. I mean, they needed the energy. It's a, such a good point, isn't it? That, that these diets were designed for people who spent every calorie they put in 
in, in effort. And, oh, and we're now eating the same diets and doing yeah. damn all except occasionally having to find the channel changer. Mm. Can I get you anything else? We have kuchen, we have blueberry Oh, kuchen. little pies. Yeah. Blueberry, blueberry, I think. Okay. Why am I doing this? Why am I continuing to okay. abuse my stomach? Not just filling, but sort of heavy. You know what I mean? Sits there in a Germanic way. Just. It's as if my heart and its vessels are Poland and this food is invade. No, I mustn't. Sorry. That's not acceptable. But, whew, there is a Germanic grandeur about this food. Mm. It squats over the Europe of my being mm. and will last a thousand years. Something else that was designed to last at least a thousand years is 250 miles away in the state of South Dakota. Out of the Black Hill Mountains was carved in the 1940s the celebrated monument that is Mount Rushmore. It took 14 years to carve the 60-foot high faces of four of the United States' most distinguished presidents. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Teddy Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln. But rather like the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square, there's a space. Any suggestions? It's one of the clichés of American tourism. The tourists seem inspired to take happy snaps and eat ice cream. But, well, is it just me, or isn't it, frankly, just a little bit... silly? I've heard, though, about a slightly less well-known and even more monumental neighbour down the road. A very determined Polish immigrant named Zhovkowski, who had worked as a sculptor on Mount Rushmore, started in the 1960s an immensely ambitious monument to the Indian chief, Crazy Horse. Stop, please. Thank you. Um, <laughs> just, no, don't you dare. On his death, Zhovkowski's son, Kaz, took up the reins of this bizarre project and hasn't dropped them yet. I suppose, Kaz, one of the most obvious questions you must get asked all the time is when, when the project will finish. Just, just keep going. The way I see it, every day you work on it, you're one day closer. It's a very good way of looking at it. Remind you of anybody? No, not me. Kaz himself. You might be tempted to say, oh, that'll do. <laughs> I don't believe so. My father he was a man of commitment. And uh, in a small way, I'm a little bit of that. I wouldn't say it was a small way. I have the modern 21st century man's impatience. I just want to see it finished now, <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> Next to the gift shop, there's a model of what it's meant to end up looking like. Oh, I don't know, call me bruisingly cynical, but it's just, just a little bit kitsch, perhaps. I mean, a worthy thing to memorialise the Native American, but there's a hint of the Sunday supplement collectible piece of art? <sighs> I don't think so. So this is all his arm pointing. And um, what direction is he pointing? Is he pointing... Southeast. Is, that, is there a particular reason for that? If you go directly southeast, it's where Columbus first landed. Right. And so he's pointing to his people. Look what's arrived on our continent. Yes. The Crazy Horse sculpture is a perhaps rather dubious expression of the grievances of American Indians. My journey now continues into the badlands of South Dakota. This vast wilderness was considered a dead space by the early settlers, hence the name Badlands. It has a strange beauty, though. The Lakota Sioux tribe make up 7% of the population of the state. It's here, in the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, that I expect to find a more authentic expression of Native American experience and identity. This is the site of a notorious massacre. What happened at Wounded Knee in 1890 shamed the history of the white man in this land. 
300 Indians, men, women and children, were slaughtered by the US 7th Cavalry. The names alone invoke the spirit of these proud but cruelly oppressed people. We are the consequences of America. You know, we are the shame of America. We're not included in America. Russell Means is a veteran campaigner for his people's rights. One out of every fourth Indian child born is fostered or adopted out to a non-Indian home. That's 25% of our future. The average age of a fluent Lakota speaker is 65. Linguists have said we've lost our language, therefore. We've got 10 to 15 years, and then we're exterminated as a people. Because it's our language, is the connection to everything. A black woman said it best. She said, you know, the white man has, has taken the taste out of our mouth. And that's what's going to happen to my people. We're going to be exterminated. The undeniable air of demoralization and despair hanging over the whole reservation can't be the whole story, surely. I wanted to see if there was any sign that the tide may be turning. I was surprised to find that amongst the young, the language and traditions of the Lakota are in fact undergoing something of a revival. If you learn with another friend, then you could just talk and tell jokes to each other. No one else can understand what you're saying. It's important to me because it's what my ancestors spoke a long time ago, and I hope that it never dies out. It can't be all gloom and doom when high school corridors reverberate with the sound of their native songs. Into Nebraska now, and the one thing they have here is space. Lots and lots of it. I am a lineman for the county And I drive the main road Searching in the sun for another overload It's hard for someone like me from a small I island to comprehend the vastness of it. Trains that seem to go on forever, and of course the long roads that are so much part of the almost mythical romance of America. And the Wichita lineman is still on the line. This vast economy needs goods to be transported in all directions, and I want to meet the people who actually make America work. American interstate highways are even numbered from east to west and have odd numbers when going north to south. The vital artery that is I-80 goes all the way from downtown San Francisco to the New York suburb of Teaneck, New Jersey, and is a favorite of that fascinating breed, the American trucker. For them, home really is wherever they hang their hat, or rather, their Stetson. And here, near Grand Island, Nebraska, is one of its largest truck stops. And I decide to introduce myself to a real-life trucker, see if I can gain an insight into their unique Hello. world. Hi, I'm Stephen. Bruce. Nice to meet you, Bruce. Wow, it's my first time. Oh, you've got a bed and everything. Yes. This is where you sleep every night when you're on the road? Yeah. Comfortable enough for you? Yes, this cut. I mean, I've got everything I need. I've got a, I've got a nice television, a microwave oven, oh, you got that. refrigerator, and a freezer. It really freezes ice. Um, this is my home, a Peterbilt truck. It's rather beautiful. Along with all the other facilities is a serious trucker's shop. This is very much a man's world. Oh, now this, yes. This you've got to have. A trucker's bed. 
And there's a happy trucker getting into his truck with the bed over his shoulder at a saucy angle. But look how happy he is there. He's got thumbs up, everything. Looking very excited. It's got a revolutional elastic skirt made with special fabric that is tough but soft, just like the trucker themselves. What on earth? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not dirty-minded, am I? I mean, what do you think this is? Well, or that? Or ooh? Are these something truckers hang from the rear view mirrors, do you suppose? Black bull balls. The American male. Odd creature. Semper Fidelis. Always faithful. Unlike most truckers, I should imagine. No, I have no evidence to support that claim. Oh, now this we definitely need. Uh-oh. I broke it. Right, fair enough. Good. Excellent. That is, they all like to put their thumbs up, don't they? To show things work. Just everything a trucker could need. Like one of these, for example. Um, which you'd need for... Well, I don't need to tell you what that's for. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Been there, 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 and there, Nebraska. And so Bruce, one of the vital cogs of the American economy, trucks off into the sunset with his oversized load of a combine harvester. What's the appeal of this life? There's nobody here nagging me about, you know, what he wants me to do next, or, you know, you go here and do that right there, you know. I'm in charge of this truck. That's pretty much it. He gives me a ride for the first few miles and then we part. I have my own travelling to do. And the Wichita lineman is still on the line. And so to Kansas. And once again, there's a feeling of space and sky and, well, not much else at all. Maybe in the towns I might find more signs of life. Or maybe not, because many of the towns have become rather ghostly. On the banks of the Missouri, the town of White Cloud. Population, not many. Its story, like so many settlements in the Midwest, is one of decay. I'm the head ghost. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephen. People call me Wolf River Bob. Wolf River Bob, nice to meet you. And, uh, <laughs> well, I was born and raised here. You were? I lived here since 1926. Oh, my goodness yeah, me. I was just a youngster at that time. And was it, um, how can I put this delicately, was it more prosperous then? Yes, indeed it was, yes. Why exactly did the town die, Bob? Well, we lost the steamboats. We lost the railroad, because it ran right along the bluff here. Yeah. And uh, it just got to the point to where the town couldn't support anything. Some people are holding faith and staying here? Some of them have no choice. Well, I guess that's it. <laughs> You're almost the very middle of America here. Yes, we are. You've got a long way to go to the ocean. How, how far would it be? Well, we've got about 2,000 miles to go to either way. And there's a lot of open space. That's... A lot of open space. <laughs> Wolf River Bob is pinning a lot of hopes for the future on tourism. Tourism dollars is mighty important to all of us nowadays. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to push on to the people living here. You know, it is a bit desolate, but on the other hand, it... Oh, I've been to worse beauty. places. We have room to grow. Yeah. A little town like this has got a lot going for it yeah. if they can just get busy with it. 
But to leave things as they stand now, nothing's going on. That's, right. that's the worst of it. Dorothy followed the Yellow Brick Road out of Kansas into Oz. And I have a strange feeling as I follow this road to, well, not an emerald palace, but a very unusual home indeed. It's an enormous underground lair, and it speaks of a dark period in our recent history. Hello? Who? Oh. Ed Pedden? Payton, yes. Payton, how do you do? Stephen, Stephen Fry, yes. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Come I, in. Bless you. Do I have security clearance? Uh, not needed anymore. <laughs> My gracious. Over this way is the launch service building where the missile was housed. Let's look at this first. In the late 1950s, this facility cost the U.S. taxpayer over $4 million. That's about $30 million in today's money. Twenty years ago, Ed Payden bought it as a derelict site for a more modest $40,000, around $100,000 in today's money. The missiles are gone, and the hippies have taken over. And where were the actual missiles? Come in. Oh. And here is the missile bay. Oh, my. The, the way this worked, the missile lie in here about 70 feet long, horizontally in this room the the ceiling 400 ton ceiling rolled back which allowed the rocket to be uh, pulled upward and it came to stand erect back there it had a 6,000 mile range it would go over the great circle route and be able to strike Moscow oh, that's over the Arctic yes yeah. yes God. and I want to show you over yeah. here there there's a brass pin in the floor here right here mark the place where the warhead uh, was positioned. And here is a picture of that warhead. And that's a thermonuclear device. It is it? a hydrogen bomb, four megaton. Oh. Many times larger than the, the, the weapons used in Japan. Right. Erection, does it say? Yes. <laughs> very funny. A very, this is a very- Erection mechanism boom. This was active during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and there was a double crew here, and this missile was ready to, to go. Gosh. Okay, down here, oh. this is the flame pit. Drops down 17 feet. And that's where the blast would be when the, when the missile rocket took off. Absolutely. Up through there. Yes. You have interfered with my plans for the last time, Mr. Bond. <laughs> No lone zone, two man policy mandatory. They would not allow a single uh, crew member to be in this room alone. They didn't want anyone ever to sabotage some of their uh, operations. Right. Okay, this, this is a 120 foot tunnel that leads from the launch service building to the launch control building, which is now our home. And that's where the button would be pressed. Absolutely, yes. And we have uh, brought in this door in to kind of break up the cement and steel look and this is the, uh, of the old missile site. Oh my. Come in, welcome. Thank you. Oh my God. Yes, this, this is a launch control panel. Oh, this is a gracious. government manual. Weapon System General USAF Model And see, here is a picture of this exact panel. Of a happy operator operation. Yes, he looks happy. Over here, the old dial where we call the president and ask him if he's sure. Uh, this actually only had one button in, didn't it? That this yes. This panel was yeah. missing was that. I think that's the cool button. Commit. Commit. And even after the missile was released, this, this kind of stuff would control cross-range correction. To, we don't want to miss Moscow. This oh. is our living room. Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Made it a, frankly, a hippie place. Yes. Well, we felt that the room had a very heavy energy. There were three guys in this room ready to 
to blow up a Russian yes. city. The space needed a little work. Yes. It needed some, <laughs> some energy improvements. The, the thing we like about this, it's very easy to heat, yeah. very easy to cool in the summer. Yeah. Because again, all of the, the ceiling, 18 inches of concrete, three feet of earth over. Ed and his wife Diana have raised a nuclear family here and started a nice business in helping others buy similar decommissioned bunkers around the country. We have two daughters. Yes. So how did they find us children living here? They learned to ride their bicycles on our half-mile paved private driveway. And then there were other days when they would say, Dad, why do we live in a hole? <laughs> now, many times I asked Diana, say, Diana, why don't we sell this for a big, nice price and live on the surface like normal people? But she never wa wants it's to. It's home. I can't leave home. I tell you, just after 9-11, our phones were hot. Some of the sales we have been making recently are to companies that are interested in secure data storage. Mm -hmm. They want to store records and computer data because, uh, you know, a lot was lost in those towers. Lovely though Ed and Diana are, the kind of thing that most makes my blood run cold seems about to happen. Gently close your eyes Breathe deeply now and you are blessed with a gift. Remembering our commitment always to love. Always to love. We've all got three minutes to live. What would you do? I know what I'd do. I'd have a peanut butter sandwich. Onwards to the state of Colorado and the shadows of the Rocky Mountains serrating the horizon once more. Colorado is home to Aspen, where the smart set ski. I ski not at all. I tried it once. I thought it was just about the most pointless thing I had ever attempted. Really, I couldn't see even the glimmerings of a point to it. But I did go on skiing holidays, which is a bit weird. I like to go to the top of the mountain, go to the highest cafe available, order a hot chocolate with a tot of rum in it, and read and write while my friends tumble down the mountainside. Not a million miles from the glistening areas of Aspen's uber-wealthy is a very different world. In the heart of Oklahoma City, as in so many other American cities, can be found a branch of the largest charity in the U.S., the good old Salvation Army. In the era of Credit Crunch America, Sally Army activity has taken on a new urgency. I think some are homeless. I think others, with the rising fuel prices in our, in our country, I think we're finding more and more working class folks who are in need because uh, they're having to make their dollars stretch further. We're not used to that uh, in our country. So I'll cherish. Now, ordinary families are more dependent than ever on their fellow Americans. Do you think Americans are a charitable people, generally speaking? I think so. People want to feel like they're making a difference in the world. Yeah. And unless you're in the military or a doctor or doing wonderful th big things out there, sometimes you don't feel like you're doing a whole lot good in this world. And by volunteering and giving back, you know, yeah. that's a way to really make a difference in somebody's lives. Spoken with conviction, I'm sure, but Salvation Army stalwart Heidi leads a double life. There's more to Heidi and to Oklahoma City than meets the eye. In the evening, both reveal a different personality. I thought it was only men who had 
safe, secure jobs by day and then turned into ravishing women by night. <laughs> no, but we, we compete against them all the time. They're better than we are. They dress better. It has a reputation for being rather naughty and saucy. Yeah, you know, that's something we really have to fight against because... Um, you know, you have the exotic dancers, the ones that take their clothes off. Yeah, the pole and, dancers. And yeah, really, yeah, it's such on like that. But belly dancing is really is very dignified dance. No, we do show some skin. We have yes. our belly showing and we have our arms showing. What's that for? You do a sword dance? Yes, would you like to try it on? I, do you think it would balance on my head? Yes, it would. Go on. Okay, you want a heavy sword because it stays on your head better. Oh and my voila, would you heavens. like to... Thank you. Have you injured yourself ever? Um, yes. <laughs> I, I, actually, I actually tried to trick once. Because you have to practice tricks. You were originally called Robert. We only take tips here and here. Right. Here and here. We do not take tips here. <laughs> Oklahoma, of course, is famously a wide-open state, full of corn and cattle and cowboys. And before I leave, I'm going to immerse myself in the true spirit of the Golden West. Yay! It's very impressive. <laughs> They call it mutton busting. It may not be quite Wild Bill Hickok, but it beats the heck out of the North Norfolk Pony Club, as I remember it. So, crossing the last state line of this leg of my journey, I arrive in one of the largest and wealthiest states of the Union, Texas. About the size of France, it's practically another country. Hot, flat as a tortilla, and dry as a tequila. It's more sophisticated than you might think. And as my taxi braves the flyovers of the capitalist Valhalla of downtown Houston, which exudes the same bravado and swagger as the rest of Texas, I wonder what it is that really oils the wheels of Texan high society. A ritzy fundraising gala seems a good place to find out. The idea is that wealth distribution comes not through taxation, but through the charitable deeds of the rich. The trickle-down effect begins its trickle at events like this, and I'm going to experience it firsthand. The Society for Performing Arts puts me to work. You're going to give so much money that you're going to shock yourself. Because, as the kind of extraordinary Houstonian citizens that you are, ones who believe in the arts, Oscar Wilde quite rightly said, all art is useless. And that may sound as if that means it's something not worth supporting. But if you actually think about it, the things that matter in life are useless. Love is useless. Wine is useless. Art is the love and wine of life. It is the extra without which life is not worth living. I managed to flog a long weekend for two in a Mexican resort for a measly $16,000. Society editor Shelby Hodges has strong views about the duties of the rich. You could move here tomorrow, 
with just six months, you'd be set socially. Right. If you knew how to behave and all of that. Anyone that comes in with a, a big checkbook, I bought a $10,000 table at your event, I want you to buy one at my event. And they really are, aren't they? When you say that $10,000 table, you mean it. Oh, yes, and that's not, that's not the high end table. At, at these events, the high end tables can go as high as $100,000. Your system of patronage and endowment works. Do you say that's yes, true? Yes, because the strong socialism thing is not very popular in the United States no, it's in not. any case. We'd rather make our money, choose where we want to give it to help others. Yeah. It is very much expected of the rich. Exactly. If you don't participate, that's when you're probably shunned. When legs begin to shimmy and bodies to sway, Stephen heads for the exit. Good night, rich Houstonians. You must dance your dance alone. Now, this kind of dance I can enjoy. En route to my final destination, the border with Mexico, I just can't resist a little detour to a beach near Houston where you're legally permitted to drive on the sand, a rare privilege. Down the Midwestern United States, the Rockies now ooze like porridge to a close. This is literally the end of the Rocky Mountains. They finish right there, and there is the pass between them and the Sierra Madre Mountains. The pass, in Spanish, is El Paso, and beyond is all Mexico. The snowy northern border with Canada all those miles ago all seems rather genteel in comparison to this down and dirty frontier. The mighty Rio Grande, literally the Great River, separates the US from Mexico here. It must surely be a formidable obstruction to any would-be immigrant. An obliging Texan shows me where it is. Oh. That's the Rio Grande? I thought of a great swirling torrent, you know, you half a mile wide. And this is, well, it's a ditch. How can America possibly police such a long and hotly contested border? They can't rely on the river's racing current, that's for sure. Next morning, entering the Border Patrol HQ in El Paso, the threat level sign elicits a warning from Agent Romero Cordero. I will ask you just to maintain, as always, a safe distance and to please, uh, obviously, not uh, get involved in, in any apprehensions. Here I am, still in the United States, and there, just yards from me, I can see Mexicans in Mexico going about their Mexican lives all Mexicanishly. This is the danger zone. There's a lot of crime here. Uh, a lot of times there's Mexican police that aren't even willing to come over here at night. Do you face violence from them? This year alone, assaults against our agents has gone up over 100%. And all the people who live along here, along the Mexican side, they, you know, they could grow up as children, just yards from America. Literally, a stone's throw away. But know that they're never allowed. Their mother would say, don't, they don't cross there. I can see now that incursions into the United States aren't that easy after all. These canals present a massive danger. Even the, the water best runs fast. It runs quick, strong and deep. We tend to lose lives in this general area. We only have a certain amount of time where we can uh, effect a rescue before that individual is gone. It's running pretty quick. Oh yes. It's a pretty good size. That is, isn't so it? that even the, the best swimmer can find themselves in some jeopardy in here. It's evidence of the extreme and dangerous lengths people go to to cross into another life. So this, this bridge behind us here, that's... Um... Right, that's the actual port of entry to go into the center of uh, downtown Juarez. It will literally throw people off the bridge, have them drop down, and then tell them to climb over the rock wall. Oftentimes, of course, once they've hit the ground, they can't get up and run because they've broken right. a leg. Mm -hmm. 
And then it all kicked off. At this point, they've got an entry. They should be just up ahead of where we're at. Oh, really? Oh, there's, there's the vehicle. There's, your, right, there's your... the agent. It looks like one of them may have tried to come in under the bridge. But we're about to find out. Oh, wow, there they are. Those two individuals had come across into the United States. They've already crossed the river once. They've gone back, and now they're being chased back into Mexico. Uh, agents are trying to secure the area because they believe there may be other individuals that are trying to get in as well at this time. <laughs> Just kind of tag along right behind them. Somewhere around here, they've got somebody, it looks like. There's some action going on, definitely. Oh, there they are. They've got them right here in the canal. Oh, yeah. This one went north and uh, Oh, wow, there they are. Yep. Oh, my. So, you can see he's got a system to get back out of there. Uh, do you guys have any more? All right. You can see the other one. There's the other guy that went back to the other side. Close by, the captive's would-be accomplice lurks out of range. Tomorrow's another day. That blend of resignation and determination so common in the desperate. These three are U.S. citizens, and in a bar by the border, they sing a happy song. Is it pure Mexican or is it like the food? Is it Tex-Mex? It's Tex-Mex. Tex-Mex. Tex -Mex. Tex -Mex. We're in Tex Texas. Part? We're yeah. Texas and we're singing our Mexican tradition. And so are you Mexican first or American first? Or? Well, I would say American-Mexican. Yo soy mexicano en cualquier terreno Conservo el orgullo Next time, I'll be exploring the overwhelming beauty, eerie vastness, and wild eccentricity to be found in the great western desert as I head towards the Pacific Ocean. And you can read more about Stephen Fry's discoveries on his journey across America in this book to accompany the series. And if you've missed any of the previous episodes, the series so far is available to watch now on BBC iPlayer. Over on BBC Two now, Premier League action in Match of the Day 2.